This video is brought to you by viewers like you. 1,600 miles off the southern coast of Hawaii sits a small uninhabited atoll, Malden Island. It's filled with vestiges of an ancient society, old housing sites, temple platforms, graves, and even mysterious paths leading directly down into the ocean floor. Who lived here and for how long is hard to say. Researching the Malden ruins is a task in and of itself because of just how remote the island is. So all we have are glimpses into a once thriving culture, a collapsed society. The collapse of society is an idea that's endured for thousands of years, from the great flood of the Bible washing away the sins of society, to the lost city of Atlantis. Humans love thinking about collapse. But collapse isn't just an idea. This is a video about the very real dangers of society collapsing in the near future. It's a really heavy topic, and it's not something we can talk about without some major warnings up front. Because societal collapse is seductive, whether it's the apocalypticism of a cult leader or the traditionalist backlash against change, you can be sure that when someone talks about the impending collapse of society, they're not just trying to sell you on an idea, but recruit you to a cause. Because if you believe you're in the end of times, then you have no alternative but to be a dedicated evangelist. This means that a lot of us, most of us really, are going to have a healthy skepticism of anything that promises to prove that collapse is coming. As we should! But this doesn't mean societal collapse is impossible. I mean, every empire in history has collapsed, and while we've evolved a lot as a species, I think just assuming we're past the possibility of collapse is equally as dangerous as drinking the Kool-Aid in the other direction. So, dear viewer, I hope you have your guard up. I hope you think critically about everything you hear in this video, and I hope you reach a conclusion on the subject because it makes logical sense, not because of fear or denial. Because when it comes to collapse, the stakes are as high as they can get. In 1968, a group of intellectuals gathered in Italy and formed the Club of Rome, an intellectual society with the noble goal of reducing inequality and improving the living conditions of people everywhere. They were specifically focused on wealth distribution, but before they could get to that, they believed they needed a way to quantify the world's resources. And as luck would have it, halfway across the world in Cambridge, MIT professor J. Wright Forrester was researching ways of simulating complex systems like the economy using the newest breakthrough in tech, the digital computer. At a conference that same year, Forrester ended up meeting Aurelio Pache of the Club of Rome. And after hitting it off, they embarked on the gargantuan task of using Forrester's work, which he was now calling System Dynamics, to model the whole world's economy and ecosystem and use that model to predict where humanity was heading. But predicting the future is hard. Really hard. In the year 1900, the Boston Globe predicted the 2000s would have cities with moving sidewalks, tube transportation systems, and personal flying vehicles. And while it's easy to laugh at how optimistic these old predictions are, you can't fault 20th century thinkers for imagining the 2000s would be better than they were. The 1900s were filled with never-before-seen progress. People in the United States started the century living in farms with one change of clothes, and halfway through they were driving cars, talking on the phone, and watching TV. The 1900s have arguably been the most influential hundred years out of the entirety of humanity's existence. So yeah, by the end some people were a little optimistic. But even if they weren't so optimistic, it's hard to predict the future because the world is chaotic complex, and sometimes downright illogical. It seems almost impossible to make accurate predictions about the future. And you'd almost be right in thinking that. Scientists can't isolate all the variables of the climate and tell you whether it's going to be raining tomorrow at 1pm with 100% certainty, but they can build predictive models based on behaviors and relationships and tell you that there's a 10% chance of it happening and you need to bring an umbrella. The system dynamics used in the study is basically that, only instead of measuring the weather, they measured the interplay between the Earth's ecosystem and human systems like the economy, 
by looking at six key variables, population, food production, industrialization, pollution, and the consumption of non-renewable natural resources. Make sure you remember that last one. They ran 12 computer simulations to map out how the world would change in the 21st century, and in 1972, they released their findings as a book, The Limits to Growth, a 200-page manuscript outlining their grim conclusions. This is what they found. If the present growth trends in world population, industrialization, pollution, food production, and resource depletion continue unchanged, the limits to growth on this planet will be reached sometime within the next 100 years. The most probable result will be a rather sudden and uncontrollable decline in both population and industrial capacity. It is possible to alter these growth trends and to establish a condition of ecological and economic stability that is sustainable far into the future. The state of global equilibrium could be designed so that the basic material needs of each person on Earth are satisfied and each person has an equal opportunity to realize his individual human potential. If the world's people decide to strive for this second outcome rather than the first, the sooner they begin working to attain it, the greater will be their chances of success. The most severe simulation, the so-called standard run, is a hypothetical future where humanity didn't take the findings seriously and continued living as normal. In this run, as the population and industrial output grow, the Earth's non-renewable resources are overexploited. They grow increasingly scarce, so capital is diverted from other sectors of the economy towards resource extraction, leading to massive cutbacks in health and education. Meanwhile, the increase in pollution unleashes disastrous environmental effects, leading to a drop in food production. By around 2020, the death rate rises, and by 2030, the global population begins to fall we lose half a billion people per decade as global living conditions regress 100 years. The model doesn't track what else could happen, but from the description alone, we can make an educated guess. Mass migration events, increase in crime and looting, war between nations, and if these nations have nuclear weapons, well, you get the idea. Needless to say, the limits to growth did not paint a pretty picture of the future, and immediately, the Club of Rome faced opposition. To the optimistic skeptics, the whole argument relied on one misplaced variable, non-renewable resources. The fear of running out of non-renewables like precious minerals and fossil fuels is one that comes up every now and again. If we're on a finite planet and minerals are a non-renewable resource, it's a matter of when they'll run out not if. But some economists argue that there's no such thing. Once you exhaust the resources that are abundant and cheap to extract from the surface, society will naturally transition into moving deeper and deeper into the earth to extract the ones that are harder to get. Copper is used in all of our electronics, and while we may eventually run out of the easy-to-mine copper, there is an exponentially larger amount of it deep below the surface only that it's more expensive to get to and make useful. But with the right technology, even just trace amounts of copper can be made useful. And opponents of the LTG argue that when it comes down to it, the economy will dedicate the technology and resources to make it so. Resource creation is the idea that you don't run out of resources, you run into them. It's been popularized by the extraction industry and it's visualized by the resource pyramid that shows the abundance of low-grade resources as you move down the pyramid. The theoretical endgame of this is the universal mining machine that could take normal piles of dirt and extract the tiny trace metals. With this, we could theoretically mine the Earth forever. And I'd love to live in the utopian future where we can separate gold from dirt, but it's just that, utopian. Extraction costs energy, a lot of energy. To be a nerd about it, the energy cost of extraction is inversely proportional to concentration. So extracting minerals from an ore that contains half of the concentration requires twice as much energy. If we had to move on to mining lower and lower grade ores, the energy cost would rise to astronomical heights, many times over what the whole world produces in a year. 
once you run out of the high grade stuff, it's just not something humans have the capacity of doing, even with sci-fi level tech. But it's precisely that level of tech arriving sometime in the near future that the optimistic skeptics are counting on. According to them, a model like limits to growth just cannot predict revolutions in the world of technology. A caveman could never make an accurate model of the future because they could never account for a technological breakthrough like agriculture. So how can we predict the future when we don't know what will revolutionize our world? Years prior to the limits to growth, two economists separately took on the effort of predicting the future and they both came to the conclusion that technological progress grows exponentially with time. And if this exponential technological growth is added to the LTG models, then the findings completely change. Human society can basically grow forever. But there are a lot of issues with this theory of exponential growth. If this theory is true, then it's the only entity in economics that is supposed to keep growing forever. Why would technological progress be the only thing that isn't subject to diminishing returns? When you look at the research, most technologies actually do exhibit this pattern of explosive growth and then slow incremental progress after. Ford revolutionized vehicles in the early 1900s, but despite the millions that go into R&D, we're not close to the flying vehicles predicted in the 50s, and probably never will be. Renowned physicist and economist Robert Ayers has published a few papers on the subject and found that technological progress may show diminishing returns. Now, don't get me wrong. This type of research is still in its infancy, so there's no hard proof of it. But this technological wildcard is the sleight of hand believers in infinite growth are counting on. It's the one thing that could save us. So considering the risk of societal collapse and the potential that technological growth could have diminishing returns, and just how near collapse is speculated to be, is that a risk we're really willing to take? By and large, 1970s America said, fuck yes, dude. That was partly because the LTG faced a mountain of opposition that buried the book for decades. Brazen, impudent, a piece of nonsense. The essential story of the LTG is one of hard science arrogance, a piece of irresponsible nonsense. This selection of responses was some of the more mild critiques. The Club of Rome was accused by otherwise reputable people of trying to enslave the world and install a global dictatorship. The people behind the study were slandered as being both maniacal evil scientists and ignorant idiots who had no idea what they were talking about. But this pales in comparison to the most enduring critique of the theory that came from libertarian Ronald Bailey who in his review of the book wrote, Limits to growth predicted that the world would run out of gold by 1981, mercury by 1985, and natural gas by 1993. We obviously haven't run out of any of those, which would be a pretty damning indictment of the book, but these predictions can't be found anywhere in the LTG. So where did Bailey get those numbers from? In short, he lied. Early in the book, the researchers used those predictions hypothetically. They're placeholder numbers the authors use so they can demonstrate a point before moving on to the actual model. But Ronald Bailey cherry-picked the passage and created the most enduring lie about the limits to growth. A lie that reached not just popular culture, but one that's been included in economic research from institutions like Harvard to dismiss the LTG outright. For the rest of the century, the limits to growth was known as that study that predicted that we'd run out of everything by the 90s. And part of this might have been inevitable. The 1900s were an optimistic century. Anyone who had bad news about the future was likely to be a black sheep. But the reaction to the LTG might have been a little less than authentic. When Rachel Carson released Silent Spring, an expose on the dangerous use of pesticides in agriculture, the agricultural industry came down hard on Carson, with a ruthless coordinated media campaign against her book. Scientists studying climate change have faced similar media blitzes against their work, and while it's impossible to know whether the LTG was the victim of this, it has all the hallmarks of a coordinated attack from big industry. And unfortunately, this campaign might have doomed us. It's been almost 50 years since the original Limits to Growth was published, 
and the calls of the researchers have gone ignored, despite the work being vindicated by retrospective reviews. A 2014 review of the work found that the real-world numbers match pretty closely with the Doomsday standard run scenario. And a 2015 recalibration review had this to say, While society has invested in mitigation of some of the impacts of our industrial output, we still live on a finite planet. Based on this paper, we cannot be sure how and when the limits will be reached, but the growth paradigm is still based on material consumption, and the planet is still limited in terms of land availability and material resources, and cannot be polluted forever. Current estimates on societal collapse by a Dutch researcher this year peg it happening around 2040, give or take. So a little less than 19 years from the release of this video. Fun stuff, right? One of the original authors of The Limits to Growth, Jorgen Sanders, actually published their own follow-up in 2012, titled 2052, A Global Forecast for the Next 40 Years. His forecast for the future takes a different approach than The Limits to Growth. He de-emphasizes running out of non-renewable resources and instead emphasizes the role of pollution and climate change. According to him, the effects of climate change will wreak unspeakable environmental damage and human suffering. This thankfully will spur the world governments into action, but by then, we'll be far past the 2 degrees Celsius warming mark that the UN warns is the point of no return. Global population will peak by 2040, GDP will stagnate, and poverty will increase. But there won't be food or resource shortages as predicted by the standard run. People will struggle to access food, but not because it's scarce. Instead, it'll be because they're poor. Sanders predicts a bleak world, but perhaps a little less bleak than previously thought. Hooray, I guess? At the end of the day, the models I talked about today are just one of the many endless predictions of the future. As it stands, most of them don't see us living in a Jetsons-style world anytime soon. Which is rough. As someone who loves sci-fi stories, it's a bit of a rude awakening to realize we're probably never gonna go to other planets, or gonna get to enjoy that level of insanely advanced tech. Reality is, the future we've all dreamed about probably won't be very futuristic. And we all know the world is shitty and exploitative, but despite that, human technology keeps on advancing. Humans might be bad at a lot of things. Equality, human rights, sure. But science is not one of them. And even then, even with that, it seems like the worst excesses of humanity have finally caught up with us. In one shape or another, collapse is coming. We've seen crisis before. Our economic system has cyclical crises built right into it. But this will be the mother of all crisis. So I think it's time we let go of our dreams of a high-tech future. There's no flying cars, no mining other planets on our horizon, only crisis, here on Earth. Sure, billionaires like Jeff Bezos might be able to live out their dreams, taking space flights, and living amongst the stars, but our dreams are gonna have to stay more down to Earth. And the more I look, the more I wonder, were these dreams ever ours to begin with? This video is free. Like, not just free to watch, but free to use as part of the Creative Commons. This is possible thanks to my patrons over on LiberaPay. If you like supporting the commons, LiberaPay is a non-profit open source patronage platform like Patreon, except that it doesn't take a cut from your donations, sell your data, or any of that nasty evil stuff corporations are doing nowadays. Your patronage is optional but deeply, deeply appreciated, as it helps me put out more videos and support on the ground organizing. If you want to see my videos ad-free, you can watch my whole catalog on odyssey.com. Like, comment, all that jazz, and thanks for watching. See you on the next one.